Welcome back everybody. This is another video in my aircraft history series or aviation history series. And this particular video is episode three of my three part series on the history of the P-51. Uh, so if you haven't seen the previous episodes down in the uh, description, uh, there will be links to episodes one and episodes two. I recommend you watch those first to get a good uh, understanding of uh, where we got to to get up to here. So episode one talked about the development of the P-51 and uh, the prototype and the first production model. Um, episode two covered the history of the Allison engine uh, Mustangs and then into the Merlin engine uh, P-51 BCs and the P-51D. And in this video, I'm going to be talking about the post P-51D development. So those includes a lot of the one-off prototypes that came out for development, uh, the P-51H, and then moving into some of the post-war development of the P-51. Uh, very few people realize that the P-51 didn't end at the end of World War II. Um, the development of the P-51 continued right up into the 1960s and even into the 1970s in some cases for the actual development of a P-51. So it's a very, very long and interesting history. So I'm going to go over all of that post-war and post-P-51D history in this video. And again, if you've seen the first two videos, some of this intro will sound somewhat repetitive uh, because I'm just going to use basically the same intro and that is that the, the amount of confusion out there on the P-51 history is amazing. Considering it's such a popular aircraft and so many people can recognize it and so many people consider it you know the best fighter of World War II, uh, very few people know the actual history behind it, the why it was developed, the who it was developed for. If you've watched the earlier episodes you understand why I'm saying some of this and then you know the differences between the B and the C model and the differences between the B and the C model and the D model. A lot of that early development history is unknown. They just know the D model. And other than that, everything else is a who cares. So hopefully if you've watched the first two videos, you have a better and deeper understanding on how the P-51 came about. And now as we move into this, you will see how amazing the development continued for the P-51. And again, so many people just believe, hey, end of World War II, that's it, P-51s were sold off surplus. No, there was a lot of development on the P-51 that happened post-war to um, the P-51D and, and, and later version. So uh, hopefully this video will show you again how much of what today we understand as a P-51 is not the P-51 of World War II. There's a lot more that went into it and there's an amazing history that happened even after the end of the war. So stay tuned. We'll learn about all of this in this video. Um, hopefully, as I've said, you guys will, will walk away from this having a, a more knowledge and a deeper understanding of the P-51 and uh, it's, it's an amazing aircraft. So stay tuned. Uh, thank you for watching the previous videos. If you have, here we go. The history of the P-51 Mustang. And as always, my name is Sean, and this is Sean's Aviation. And just before we get into the video, um, something I should have been doing a lot more up till now, and that is just asking you guys out there, if you enjoy what you're looking at, if, you're, if you like what I'm doing, go down below, uh, click on the, the like page, subscribe to my, my channel, and uh, by all means, please click on that little notification bell. If uh, that way you guys get, uh, uh, get alerted when I do get more new content up. I usually try to do the what's on my desk uh, monthly update beginning of the month. And I usually try to get a video or a series of videos released um, by the 15th, the middle of the month. So whether that's going to be a uh, tips and tricks video or an aviation history video or my time lapse videos of the previous model builds that I've got done or uh, an air show video or, you know, um, some of my new product review videos I'll be doing. So I'm going to try to get something posted uh, by the middle of the month. So uh, please, if you're enjoying this, subscribe, like and click that notification bell. Let's move on to the video. So as you've seen, if you've been watching the previous videos, you've seen the P-51 evolve from basically a P-40 replacement fighter all the way up to the P-51D, sort of the ultimate fighter of World War II. So as with any aircraft, as new models are designed and new equipment is added and more fuel and weapons are carried, the weight goes up. And as a consequence, performance goes down. 
So the P51D was almost 500 pounds heavier than the P51B and C and nearly 1500 pounds heavier than the P51A. And even with the increased horsepower of the Merlin engine, that extra weight still had a consequence. So one of the reasons for this is that when the D was designed, North American Aviation used the United States Army Air Force system for calculating load factors, which was uh, more conservative, whereas the RAF had one that was more liberal. In July of 1943, the United States Army Air Force approved a proposal to redesign the P-51 using the RAF method, allowing for a reduction in some structural components as well as using smaller items where and when possible. The P-51 would be going on a diet similar to what the P-40 had gone through when it was redesigned into the P-40N. So the P-51F was the first of the lightweight Mustangs with a contract for five under the North American Aviation Proposal approved by the United States Army Air Force in July of 1943. This aircraft had the wing almost completely redesigned with a new straight leading edge and much more efficient laminar flow profile, which meant it was thinned back down closer to what it looked like in the B model and the armament was reduced back down to four 50 caliber guns. The fuselage fuel tank was removed as performance was deemed more important than range and the main landing gear legs, doors, wheels, and brakes were all reduced in size to save weight. So here you can see a uh, picture with the original gear and the new lightweight gear. The four-bladed um, ha uh, Hamilton Standard Prop was replaced by a three-bladed Aero Products unit, uh, which you can see here, and a much larger, longer, and streamlined canopy was installed, the only extra weight added to the airframe. There was not much left that was common with the D model, the engine was to have been the V1650-3, but they were fitted with the more powerful V1650-7, the same as the later model P51Ds before they were complete. The radiator housing was also deeper and longer with a more streamlined look and had a more vertical intake than that of the earlier models. So again, here you can see the earlier um, radiator housing on the top and the new one located on the bottom. So some minor, minor metal parts were replaced with molded plastic and the aircraft were, in the end, 2,000 pounds lighter than the D model, and the top speed was increased by over 25 miles an hour in level flight at 29,000 feet, which, in the grand scheme of things, is pretty impressive. So only three of the five were completed, and the first flight was on February 14th, 1944, with the second flying on May 20th, and the third on May 22nd. One of the airframes was later delivered to the RAF for further testing, being known, as I said, as the Mustang 5. The final two airframes were further modified into the P-51G prototypes, which we'll talk about in a little bit. The top speed was not as high as the United States Army Air Force had expected, and some handling problems due to high load factors and an inconsistent flight stability issue forced the United States Army Air Force to bypass this model for a later one. So what are some of the distinctive features of this model? So first of all, it's got a larger, more streamlined canopy, the larger radiator housing with a vertical intake, a three-bladed prop, and redesigned nose panels. The next attempt at a lightweight P-51 was the P-51G. So the P-51G production run consisted solely of the two final P-51F aircraft, and these were fitted with the Rolls-Royce Merlin-14SM. This engine was a development of the Merlin 100 that replaced the carburetor with a Skinner Union fuel injection system. So this system was touchy and was very hard to get working right, but when it did work, the engine would put out 2,080 horsepower at 20,000 feet with a climb rate of over 5,000 feet per minute. So the P-51G was designed to have the five-bladed rotor propeller, the same used as the Spitfire Mark 14. However, this prop was not available at the time of rollout, and the two aircraft were fitted with a standard four-bladed aero products unit. The first aircraft had the rotor prop fitted for the fourth test flight, but it was deemed highly unstable and was unsuitable for further testing. All subsequent flights were with the four-bladed unit. And so here is a picture of the P-51G fitted with the rotor five-bladed prop. The first flight of the P-51G took place on August 9th of 1944, with a top speed of 495 miles per hour reached during a metered flight and air speeds of over 500 miles per hour were reported. The aircraft had potential service ceiling of over 46,000 feet, 
but since the cockpit was unpressurized, test pilots had to drop back down to a more comfortable altitude before the maximum altitude was reached. Although the performance was phenomenal, the Merlin 14-SM was not in full production and many of the stability issues present in the F model still existed and were in most cases made worse due to the increase in power and torque. As such, the aircraft was not put into production. So what are the, some of the distinctive features of the P-51G? So first off, it's externally similar to the P-51F. It was fitted with either the force bladed aero product or the five bladed rotal propeller. So the next attempt at producing a lightweight P-51 was the P-51H and this was the only lightweight P-51 model to actually go into production. So the data I obtained with, from both the P-51F and the P-51G test programs, North American Aviation engineers decided to develop a compromise aircraft, one that would take advantage of the lightweight airframe but could be placed into immediate production using uh, lessons learned on the P-51D. So the decision was made to use the basic F fuselage with the V1650-9 engine, one that could be guaranteed to be available, mated to an 11 foot 1 inch Aero Products 4 bladed propeller. So this engine put out 1,930 horsepower, which was almost as much as the Merlin 14-SM, or Merlin 14-SM, but was significantly more reliable. The directional stability problems were partially solved by stretching the fuselage 13 inches between the cockpit and the tail, and this was first developed in the P-51J, which we'll get to in a little bit. From the 20th production aircraft onwards, a taller tail unit was also installed to further combat the instability issues, and the earlier aircraft had this tail retrofitted eventually. So you can clearly see the difference between the original D-style tail and the new taller H-model tail. The canopy was reduced back to the standard D model, but the whole cockpit was raised several inches to increase the pilot's visibility. The carburetor intake was also slightly smaller than on previous models. The projected performance of the H model, based on the FNG data, resulted in the United States Army Air Force ordering 2,000 Inglewood built aircraft in June of 1944. The first flight of a P-51H took place on February 3rd of 1945, and other than the lateral stability problem that was later solved with the taller tail, no major issues presented themselves. Top speed was found to be 487 miles per hour at 25,000 feet, making it the fastest production piston fighter built during World War II. The DO-335 has the distinction of being the fastest piston fighter to enter combat with a top speed of 475 miles per hour. Several items deleted in the P-51F to save weight were restored in the H, including the armament, which was back up to 650 caliber machine guns and the fuselage fuel tank was reinstalled, although its capacity was reduced down to only 50 gallons. The provision to carry underwing drop tanks was also incorporated and they were fitted with six zero length five inch rocket stubs, but they were staggered around the hard point instead of only being outboard as in the P-51D. So as always, clear pictures are hard to come by, but you can see the hard points under the wing here with the two rocket stubs outboard and one inboard of the hardpoint. With 110 gallon drop tanks, the combat range was 1104 miles, over 100 miles more than that of the P-51D. As with previous models, the production was broken down into separate blocks. So some of the significant block numbers for the H are the P-51H-1NA, which is the initial production with the original detail, and only 20 were built. The P-51H-5NA, the new taller tail incorporated, only 280 were built. And the P-51H-10NA, which was similar to the dash 5NA, but had some minor radio changes. 255 were built. So what are some of the distinctive features of the P-51H? Uh, so it's got the longer, deeper radiator uh, housing with the vertical intake, similar to the F and the G. It has a four bladed aero products propeller. It's got a smaller chin intake. It's got a D style canopy. Most of them were fitted with the taller tail. And it also has a thinner wing with no leading edge kink compared to a, a D Mustang. And it has smaller landing gear, wheels and gear doors. 
Although the performance was a significant leap from the P-51D, there were two critical events that curtailed its production run. The end of World War II and the beginning of the jet age. Only 555 of the 2,000 ordered were produced and none saw combat during World War II or Korea, the only production P-51 to have never seen combat. With the mass production of P-80s, P-84s, and F-86s, P-51Hs were quickly sent down to no fewer than 61 Air National Guard units, with the last H model being retired in 1957. So next, uh, if you follow the alphabet, the next aircraft should be the P-51I. However, this designation was never used. And uh, I only bring it up because if you notice, no U.S. Army Air Force aircraft ever used the I designation as it was due to possible confusion between the letter I and the Roman numeral one. So the next model of the P-51 we're going to talk about is the P-51J and it's actually the final variant that was built by North American Aviation. Now you might think that the P-51J came after the P-51H because alphabetically that's how it falls. But in reality, the J model came about before the H and that was simply because the idea to build the J came about after initial design work on the H started. So it just took the next sequential letter, which was J, but it was built and produced before the H. And the idea was to take the F and the G and with those lessons learned, make the ultimate lightweight P-51. So they, the uh, lessons learned from the F and the G and the airframes were made with a brand new experimental engine and uh, they went all out to make the absolute perfect P-51 design. So only two P-51Js were ever built and the second one was never flown, being scavenged for parts to keep the first flying. So it was effectively an F model but to counter the directional stability issues that both the F and the G and had, they included a nine inch stretch behind the cockpit and it was fitted with an experimental Allison V1710-119. Now this engine was developed to be similar to the Merlin-14 SM that we saw in the P51G. However, the carburetor intake was a ram style that was fitted in the radiator intake housing with the air being then piped forward to the engine. So this removed the need for a chin intake, creating a slightly more streamlined look. The engine, however, had many flaws. It was very unreliable, and it took many years to iron out all of the problems. The airframes were eventually loaned to Allison for engine testing, and the V1710-119 was, in time, turned into a viable engine and was ex used extensively by the later North American P-82, which we'll get to in a bit. So the aircraft flew for the first time on April 23rd of 1945, and although top speeds of over 500 miles per hour in the 27,000 to 30,000 foot range were predicted, ongoing engine troubles meant that these figures were never verified. So some of the distinctive features of the P-51J are the stretched rear fuselage, the long, P-51 F and G canopy, the longer and deeper radiator housing, and importantly, it has no chin intake. So now we're actually gonna get to um, two models that they talked about, but never actually built, and that was the P-51L and the P-51M. So the P-51L was a designation that was set aside for Dallas-built P-51Hs that were, set, that were to be fitted with the newer V1650-11 engine. This engine was to have direct fuel injection, similar to the Merlin 14-SM, uh, that was fitted to the P-51G. With the end of the war, the entire engine and airframe order was cancelled, and none of the 1700 were ever built. And the P-51, although it seems to be backwards, was the designation for the Dallas-built P-51H that were going to be identical to the Inglewood built H's in every way. And again, due to the end of hostilities in Europe, the entire order was canceled. And of the 1,628 ordered, only one was built. 66 partially completed airframes were scrapped on the production line. So the P-51J was the last North American aviation involvement with the P-51 program itself although uh, many air forces continued to use the P-51 into the post-war era with, uh, for example, the um, 
uh, P-51D being used by the U.S. Air Force up through the uh, Korean War. The RCAF used them up until the end of the 1950s. And a number of other air forces, as I've mentioned before, continued to use them relatively late with the Dominican Air Force not retiring them until the mid-1980s. Uh, there were, however, a number of post-war modifications that the P-51, uh, specifically the P-51D model, ended up going through, uh, but they were not uh, done by North American Aviation proper, but by a company called Cavalier. And we're going to talk about these next. So in the immediate post-war era, and as well as when other air forces began to retire the P-51s, um, there were many plans and modifications made to make the P-51 a better aircraft for the civilians who were going out and buying these aircraft. From extra seats to extra fuel tanks, uh, and even a case of ramjets to increase its top speed, uh, the list of um, post-war modifications is a long one. So there are a number of entrepreneurs who went about starting up businesses to cater to these post-war ex-military P-51 owners. And the most successful of these was a gentleman by the name of David Lindsay, who was a newspaper publisher of all things. So he saw the writing on the wall, realized that P-51s would be an interesting business to get into. And so in 1957, he started a company called Trans Florida Aviation and began, began purchasing uh, a large number of the ex-RCAF and USAF P-51s, mostly the D models that were being retired. So modifications uh, included uh, stripping out all of the military equipment um, updating the avionics and radios to a more modern civilian standard, uh, removing the fuselage fuel tank and adding a second seat behind the pilot, plushing out the interior to make it more comfortable for the uh, passenger and pilot to sit in, and in some cases, retrofitting the taller tail. So this taller P-51 tail uh, helped keep the P-51D slightly more stable in the yaw direction. Um, so he actually received an FAA t supplemental type certificate for these taller tail modifications and then he, he went out and got down to business. So initially he named his aircraft, not surprisingly, the Trans Florida Mustang, but he quickly settled on the name Trans Florida Cavalier Mustang, which most people just ended up calling the Cavalier Mustang. And I'm not entirely sure where he got the name Cavalier, but apparently uh, it worked and uh, it has stuck around. So he had five base models with the uh, model number denoting the available, the available range. So the different versions of the Cavalier Mustang were the Cavalier 750, which was just a base Mustang with its stock uh, wing fuel tanks. The Cavalier 1200, which was a Cavalier 750 with two additional 45 gallon wing tanks located in the gun bays. The Cavalier 1500, which again was just a base 750 with a 63 gallon uh, wing tank in the gun bays. The Cavalier 2000, which was a base Cavalier 750 with 110 gallon tip tanks. And the Cavalier 2500, which was the 750 with the 63 gallon gun bay tanks and the 110 gallon tip tanks. So the first conversion was completed in 1958 and a total of about 20 uh, between the different versions were built between 1958 and 1969. So in 1962, Cavalier was contacted by North American Aviation at this point called Rockwell Aviation to build a Mustang for famed pilot and World War II vet Bob Hoover as a demonstration aircraft. So he used it to promote uh, North American aviation as well, as I said, called Rockwell at the time, at air shows and military bases all over the U.S., and it was replaced by a second Cavalier Mustang in 1971. So this helped build Cavalier's reputation with both the public and, more importantly, the U.S. government. So in 1963, due in some part to the fame of Bob Hoover's Mustang, Trans Florida was contracted to refurbish three P-51s for the Dominican Air Force. All the work was completed at the Trans Florida factory in Sarasota, Florida, and the contract was completely fulfilled in 1965. This then led to work from Guatemala, Nicaragua, and Bolivia, usually trading spare airframes for the work as these countries were severely crash-strapped. 
i.e., you know, uh, uh, for example, Guatemala might send 10 aircraft, but only get seven back fully uh, fitted out. And Trans Florida ended up with an extra three airframes, which they could then turn around and sell onto the civilian market or onto other air forces as needed. So he would also buy any Mustang parts he ran across to add to his growing inventory of original spares. Many times he was bidding for parts against scrappers whose only intention was to melt them down. So as his work became better known and the name Cavalier more widely recognized, he decided to rename the company, smartly, the Cavalier Aircraft Company. He did this in 1967 and he purchased the rights to the P-51 design from North American Aviation. The same year, the U.S. Air Force contacted Cavalier to produce effectively new P-51s by reconditioning older stocks to be provided to South American Air Forces under the Military Assistance Plan. So these were called F-51 Mustang IIs, not to be confused with the RAF Mustang II, and were given new serial numbers beginning with either the 67 or 68 dash number, depending on what fiscal year they were purchased in. Now, just for those who aren't sure uh, what it is, the Military Assistance Plan was a program that the U.S. government set up to provide military supplies for both, for example, Air Forces, Navy, and Army to less well-off countries that they would then be able to use against the global fight in communism. So these F-51 Mustang IIs incorporated many changes from the civilian Mustangs, but were optimized for ground attack. So modifications include the V-1650-724 delivering 1,800 horsepower, a new military radio package, the taller P-51H tail, stronger wings with 650 caliber machine guns, and up to eight hard points able to carry up to 4,000 pounds of ordnance, and finally, the tip tanks from the Cavalier 2000 and 2500 models. Nine single seat and two twin seats were ordered in 1967, with nine, including the two twin seats, going to Bolivia and two single seats going to the U.S. Army as chase aircraft for the AH-56 Cheyenne attack helicopter program. In 1972, a second order for five was placed for export to Indonesia, uh, now, these didn't have the tip tanks, but six more that were sold to El Salvador did have tip tanks installed. So, in 1968, it was decided to try to mate the Cavalier Mustang with a Lycoming T-55 turboprop engine and compete in the Pave Coin Light Attack competition. As David Lindsay was unable to acquire a T-55, which at the time was strictly a military engine, he settled on the Rolls-Royce Dart 510 and it was fitted to the P-51 November 6167 uniform. And as you can see, this is probably one of the most ugliest aircraft, in my opinion, that ever flew. Some people love the look of it. I think it's ugly. I would probably still you know, build a model of one just because it's so weird looking, but it's weird looking. So this aircraft was called the Turbo Mustang II and was able to carry much more weight than the regular piston engine Mustang II and was cheaper to operate per hour. Unfortunately, the Cavalier Aircraft Corporation did not have the manufacturing capacity or the political clout to compete and Lindsay sold the rights to Piper in 1970 and then sold off Cavalier in 1971 and went to take a job with Piper Aircraft. So the final incarnation of the P-51 came with the Piper PA-48 Enforcer. So Piper, now the main contractor for the Turbo Mustang and with David Lindsay working on the project, the Enforcer design started to take shape. With Piper's contacts and financing, they were able to lease two T-55 engines from the United States Air Force. Two Mustang airframes were heavily modified to create the Enforcer, one a single seat, the PE-1, and one twin seat, the PE-2. So you can see the difference between the uh, PA-48 and the original Turbo Mustang, and the, PE, uh, so the, the PA-84 was also built with the, uh, many of the hard points located on the wing. So after 200 hours were flown with great results, the twin-seat aircraft was lost, 
on July 12th of 1971 off the coast of Florida due to flutter caused by a modified elevator trim tab. Despite doing well in the paved coin flight test, no orders were forthcoming. For another eight years, Piper continued to lobby to get the Enforcer purchased, and in 1979, $11.9 million was allocated to Piper to build two brand new PA-48s. When the new PA-48s rolled off the production line, only about 10% of the structure was shared with the original P-51D that it was based off of. They were almost completely new aircraft. In 1983 and 1984, they were tested by the United States Air Force, and just like in 1971, they performed very well in their attendant job, but the U.S. Air Force again decided to not purchase any aircraft. So with that, it ends the official life of the P-51. Now, um, with the current Warbird market, there are a large, large number of P-51s still out there. Uh, with the number I saw today, there's roughly 140 odd airworthy P-51s in the world. And that's just airworthy. That doesn't count anything that's sitting in a museum or in somebody's backyard or in a barnyard somewhere or, you know, at the bottom of an ocean waiting to be recovered and restored into flying condition. Uh, now, for everything you've just seen, if you've gone through the previous two videos and seen all the different versions of the P-51 and all of the different um, versions and, and bits and pieces that are added to them, when you're looking at a modern Warbird P-51, you can throw almost everything I just said out the window. Uh, many of the P-51s that are out there today have been modified for owner's likings. For example, you'll have a lot of P-51s that get rebuilt into a twin seat trainer, a full dual control uh, P-51. Um, they may be labeled as TF-51s or TP-51s, but they're gonna be very different than the original format. A lot of P-51s have the taller H-tail fitted, especially if they have a twin seat just to help with that directional stability. You've got variations in propellers and cowlings and wings. You've got P-51Ds that have been modified into earlier P-51Bs or Cs or even As. Um, a good example of that is the P-51A Polar Bear. Um, it is a P-51D fuselage that's been modified with a Razorback and has an Allison engine. So it is just a hodgepodge of bits and pieces. So in today's Warbird world, it is very, very difficult to look at an aircraft and using the information I provided, get a full understanding of what you're looking at. The other part that happens is data plates get swapped all the time. Plane A will be flying and plane B will be flying and then plane A will crash and plane B will crash and somebody will get the wreckage of plane B but then buy the data plate from plane A and put the data plate on plane B and then plane B becomes plane A but what's left of plane A gets rebuilt and is flying again without a data plate or with a different identity. Stuff gets swapped around so much it is very difficult to keep track for some of the airframes today. What is what, what started off as what and everything else. So um, it is not easy to look at a Warbird and understand exactly what you're looking at as there is a lot of confusion for some models. Now that being said, there is still one more aircraft that we have to go over. And that is sort of a distant cousin of the P-51 that came out of the same factory. So we're gonna be talking to finish this off of the F-82 twin Mustang. So as World War II dragged on and the war in the Pacific intensified, United States Army Air Force leaders realized that they were going to need a fighter that could escort the B-29s to and from mainland Japan to complete the bombing missions that were planned. They knew uh, North American Aviation had experience building long-range fighters with the P-51, so they were approached to design a long-range escort fighter for the B-29 missions. Now, North American Aviation engineers realized that technically the building of such a long-range fighter was easily possible. I mean, the P-51D was already doing eight, nine-hour missions from England to Berlin and back. The issue arose with pilot endurance. Those missions were reaching the absolute limit of what a, a human body could manage sitting in a single-person fighter. You know, eight hours, nine hours, not getting up, not moving, um, going through the high G turns and, and the stresses, plus just the stress of combat. Eight or nine hours was the absolute limit that a human body could manage before things started to go completely wrong for the pilot. So they decided that they were going to start to design a P-51 that had two pilots. So North American Aviation's plan was to basically mate 
two modified XP-51s to a new central wing section, effectively creating a double fuselaged P-51. With the capture of Iwo Jima, the need for a very long range fighter was not as desperate and design work was slowed. As with many of the assumptions people make about the P-51, the P-82 is no different. While many believe the aircraft to simply be two P-51s joined together, in reality the final design had very little in common with the single seat variant. The final design for the XP-82 consisted of two modified XP-51 fuselages lengthened by 57 inches just after the radiator. The engines were the V1650-11 producing 2,270 horsepower each, installed with each prop turning in different directions to counter the torque. The P-82A would have Allison V1710-119s, the same engine that we saw back in the P-51J, rotating in the same direction, but that model was never built due to ongoing issues with the engine. Both cockpits had full controls, but only the left one had full instrumentation. The canopies were the same as fitted to the P-51H. The armament of six machine guns was contained in the center wing section, while with the entire outer wing, similar to those on the P-51H, holding 196 gallons of fuel and having provisions for two hardpoints on each side for a total of four hardpoints. The main gear was modified to mount to the lower fuselage and retracted inboard with the main wheels sitting in the center wing section. In March of 1944, the United States Army Air Force ordered 500 based on the proposal. The first flight took place on April 5th of 1945 and the performance stats were encouraging with a top speed of 482 miles per hour at 20,000 feet with a range of almost 1,400 miles on internal fuel alone. When the war ended in August of 1945, the order for 500 was cut back to only 20. 18 would be P-82Bs, basically similar to the prototype, with one XP-82C night fighter with the SCR-720 radar, the same that was fitted to the P-61, and one XP-82 night fighter with the APS-4 radar. The XP-82C had the radar pod under the center wing extended far out in front of the propellers to reduce distortion caused by the spinning propellers. You can clearly see the difference in the two pods in this picture while with the XP-82 with the short pod located under the center section. None of the B models made it to combat units with all of them being used for testing and training duties and the C and D never entered production. One of the P-82Bs was used to show its long legs flying 5,051 miles from Hawaii to New York non-stop. This aircraft is now on display at the U.S. Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio, so anybody can go and take a look at this record-breaking aircraft. The most common version of the P-82 was the E model, utilizing two Allison V-1710-143 engines similar to the P-82A's engines, but with the engines turning in opposite directions. So the V-1710-145 was the designation for the opposite turning version of the engine uh, of the V-1710-119 engine that was in the um, P-51J. So other than the exhausts, the aircraft were identical to the P-82B. The decision to change engines was due to Packard stopping production of the Merlin engine when the war was over. Ordnance options included the six fixed 50 caliber machine guns in the center wing section and bombs or rockets on the outboard pylons. A pod had been designed that could be fitted under the center wing section that would hold an additional eight machine guns, but this was never put into production. You can clearly see the gun pod in this picture and you get a good overview of the large amount of ordnance that the P-82E could carry. An order for 250 was placed in October of 1946 and the first went into service in March of 1948. The delay was due to problems with the Allison engine and the program was almost killed off as a result of the long maturation period for that Allison engine. The last P-82E was retired from frontline service in 1951, being replaced by an F-84 Thunderjets, a service life of only three years. In contrast, the P-51D Mustang continued up until the late 1950s. You know, that was oh, what, probably a lifespan of uh, 13 to 14 years, whereas this P-82 only had three years in service. Production stopped after only 100 were built. P-82F and P-82G were both night fighter versions of the P-82E, similar to the C and D we saw before. The F had the SRC-20 um, radar that was mounted on the C model, 
and the G had the APS-4 radar that we saw mounted to the D, with both radars being mounted in the longer pod extending out beyond the propeller to reduce that radar distortion from the spinning propeller. The H model was nothing more than a winterized FRG for use in the Arctic. 91 Fs and 59 Gs were built with 18 later being modified into the H. Post-1947, as with the P-51, P-82s were redesignated F-82s with the creation of the United States Air Force. A small number of F-82Gs were stationed in Japan when the Korean War broke out, and a few of those were sent into combat. This type shot down the first two enemy aircraft during that conflict, a Yak-7 and a Yak-11, on June 27th of 1950. They were phased out in 1952, being replaced by the F-94 Starfires. It was the last piston-powered fighter to be, in pro to be produced in any quantity for the United States Air Force, and when the final F-82 rolled off the line, the production of the North American Aviation P-51 family finally came to an end. So there you have it, folks. The story of how the P-51 went from a essentially a long-shot design with very little interest from the U.S. government to one of the most important fighters of World War II to one of the most influential P uh, piston engine designs uh, that lasted you know, in service for nearly 10 years and with other air forces around the world in frontline service for nearly 40 years. The jump in performance over its lifespan was exceeded only by that of the Spitfire. Its top speed was increased from 382 miles per hour with the RAF Mark I to 487 miles per hour with the P-51H. Empty weight was increased from a low 500, uh, sorry, 5,990 pounds with the Mark I to an absolute high of 7,600 and 35 pounds with the P-51D. The P-82 had an empty weight of 15,615 pounds with a maximum weight of 24,000 pounds. With just over 16,000 built, including the CAC Mustangs and all of the F-82s uh, F or P-82s, there was one of the only aircraft to have been in continuous production throughout the U.S.'s involvement in the war. Today, there are just over 291 P-51 of all variants left with, as I think I said earlier, roughly 170 still flying. Uh, that number fluctuates slightly as restorations are flown, put on display, um, and other airworthy machines are either relegated to museums or, in the worst of cases, uh, are destroyed in crashes. So I hope, uh, for those of you who have watched these three videos, um, they were informative for you guys and you were able to actually learn something from these. And I thank you for those who, uh, who did stick it out and have watched all three videos. If for any reason you missed a video, uh, please go back and watch the, all of them. I find that uh, these series are going to mean a lot more if you actually watch all three videos. So uh, if you haven't seen them all three, please go back and watch them if you have. Thank you very much for watching them. And again, I hope you guys learned something uh, from these three videos. Thank you for watching, guys. And as always, if you are interested in any of the content you see, you can access my website at www.shawns-aviation.com. Uh, you can see all the uh, latest pictures of aircraft and museums and the build logs of all of my current models and past models on that site. And if you're interested in any of this content, uh, please click the subscribe button here on uh, YouTube to follow more. Thank you very much and see you guys next time.